Okay, so I'm Zev, um, and we're the Solenoid Test Mechanism Senior Project Group. I'm Lane. I'm Ryan. And I'm Joseph. Okay, I'll get us uh, started off here with the background. So the company that we were working with uh, was Parker Hannafin, and specifically the Control Systems Division. And they manufacture components for aerospace, specifically aviation. And we were working with uh, their hydraulic fluid control systems in order to help them improve their manufacturing process, specifically for hydraulic solenoids, because the solenoids are subcomponents on a lot of the other parts that they use. So they manufacture a lot of them and they operate at about 6,000 PSI. So there's a lot of safety concerns that are relevant in uh, testing and validating them for use in the aerospace industry. So Lane is gonna talk about the, the problem that we were faced with this semester. All right. Okay, so with the, the current way that they do things at Parker, uh, the test, test end requires a lot of interaction from the technician. So the solenoids are tested particularly uh, sorry, sorry. The, the solenoids are tested partially built, and then they're tested again uh, after full assembly. And this is done on on two different test stands. So there are several different test stands in their facility that you, that they use. And our task was to design a a mechanism that increased the productivity and didn't require as much involvement from the technician. So the metrics uh, that are designed has to meet, as you can see on the slide there, it has to operate safely at 6,000 PSI. We need to be able to perform both test functions, the partially built and the fully assembly on the same test stand. Connect seven different solenoid configurations to the same manifold, uh, increase the production uh, capacity, uh, resist corrosion from the hydraulic fluid, which is SkyDraw, uh, incorporate the placement of sensors for future automation of the validation process, safely and accurately secure the solenoids and their electrical port to the fixture, and redesign of the hydraulic ports to allow cross flow on specific solenoids, which Ryan is going to describe in more detail. So in figure one, you can see the bottom of all the solenoids. Um, they each have four ports, uh, cylinder, pressure, and return. And depending on if the solenoid is energized, pressure will either pass from pressure to return or pressure to cylinder. Um, in terms of the seven variations among the solenoids, there's one with the RNC port swap depicted here in the figure. Um, there's another one with uh, two electrical connectors instead of the just one. And lastly, some solenoids have O-rings on the bottom of them, uh, while others do not, as seen here. Um, so our design needs to account for these discrepancies. Um, in figure two, you can see the assembly of our design. Um, you have the manifold at the bottom, uh, a top plate just above that. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but the electro connector is slotted into that top plate. It's where that uh, largest hole is. Um, you see the four solenoids, the guide rods on the side, and a top plate. So the design that we can, came up with uh, handled all these constraints, consisting of five major parts, the manifold, the two guide rods, the three interchangeable bottom plates, uh, four electro connector adapters, and a top plate. The manifold is, a, is the base block of our design. It routes hydraulic fluid from the pipe fittings to the initial ports on the top surface. Um, it needed to be tweaked a little bit uh, from the original design to account for these vertical rods and the change of the location of the ports. Um, the bottom plate, which is just above the manifold, redirects the fluid from the manifold to the actual solenoid. Um, and each solenoid has one of the three bottom plates associated with it. 
Each plate also has tapered pins sticking out of it. So when the solenoid comes down, it'll align the ports of the solenoid with the ports of the bottom plate. Additionally, you have the connector adapter that'll slot into it. Um, that's for the male connector on the solenoid to come on down and it'll surround that, that male plug uh, on, the, on the bottom plate. And then additionally, that connector also clamps down on a uh, female plug, female cable, to create that connection. Um, so, and then lastly, we have the top plate. The top plate uh, will slide up and down these guided rods and it applies the force to the solenoids once it's bolted down. If you were to pull it up, it can pull up ha halfway uh, on the top of the rod and then slide on over. Uh, so, and then it can cantilever there, so the, it doesn't need to be fully removed or anything like that. Um, so next we'll just show, I'll show a little video of the whole assembly being fastened down. So. Okay, so Ryan just gave us the solution and now we're gonna play the animation just to visualize what's going on. So now we were gonna remove the bolts, then we would remove the top plate and then you could remove the solenoids. Uh, the electrical connector adapters would be removed as well. And then if you were gonna change out bottom plates to do a different type of solenoid, you would remove them all the way from the manifold. Uh, and then if you need a different bottom plate, you could go ahead and reinsert the bottom plate back onto the manifold. And then your electrical, or your, sorry, your top plate will slide back in place. Your electrical connectors will also slot back in place. And then your solenoids are ready to be uh, back and into service and they get slotted back into place again as well. And then we're gonna see basically back where we started, the top plate's gonna slide down and the bolts are gonna attach. And that would be uh, your final assembled version of the solenoid uh, mechanism. Okay, so now Joseph's gonna talk about the analysis and kind of how we got to this point. Okay, so uh, we did what's called a finite element analysis of the top plate. Uh, we call it FEA. And FEA is where we break a part into many different little pieces and we look at the forces and stresses on each of those little pieces. And this gives us a pretty good idea just in general of what happens to the parts in real life. So the first thing we looked at is to make sure that parts won't permanently deform. Uh, so as you can see here in this image, the yellow half circle um, portions of the, of the top plate is where the top plate um, mates with the solenoid surface. And they're experiencing, as we would expect, the highest stress in this design. But we found that uh, with our calculations that it's 12 times lower than the yield stress that would actually cause any permanent deformation. So this is a really conservative design to uh, yield stress. Um, Next, we also did FEA analysis to look at the force distribution across the whole plate to make sure that each solenoid was held down with approximately the same force. And ultimately, what we're trying to do here is to make sure that each force is evenly forced. We don't want to put more force on one solenoid and less on another or more on one side of a solenoid and less on the other. And with 6,000 PSI working pressure, each solenoid is going to exert about 500 pounds on the top plate. So one of the most difficult parts of our design was to actually figure out how to deal with this really high force. So we used FEA, uh, we tested several different plate designs and thicknesses, as well as several different bolt per, uh, patterns and bolt torques, and just looking to find the best design to minimize the material required for the top plate, and also to ensure that we get an even force distribution. So the top plate was actually uh, by far the most uh, revised part in our design. Um, our final solution has the four bolts uh, torqued each to 60 inch pounds, which will exert about 1200 pounds on each solenoid. So that gives us a safety factor of two to the least force solenoid. So there's still a little bit of variation on the force that these solenoids are going to experience. 
but these differences are negligible with our uh, design. So we also met with a machinist at Parker Hannafin and discussed how we could improve the machinability of our models. So we were able to implement the recommendations that he had and make our parts really easy to be machined uh, to save them money on, on building these things. And for the non-custom parts that we're using, such as the bolts, the guide rails, and bushings, we sourced those parts from McMaster Car and Car Lane, which are well-known industrial part distributors. So that gives them the short lead times on these parts if they ever need to get replaced, which will minimize their downtime if they require replacement. And lastly, for each of our drawings, we followed the recommendations of Parker Hannafin's gd and expert, which Lane will discuss in further detail. Yeah, so as he moves the presentation down to the next uh, drawing here. So this is a drawing that we created of the manifold and it shows some of the dimensions on there. And basically, um, <clears throat> we met with like Joseph said, the GD&T expert at Parker. And GD&T stands for the Geometric Dimensioning and Tolerancing. So these jet engineering standards are uniform practices for stating and interpreting dimensioning and tolerancing and related requirements for use on engineering drawings. So um, those standards basically tell us, you know, how the drawings should be made, where datum should be put, what symbols should be on the drawings, and you know what the, how the dimensions should look. Um, basically, um, in the tolerance part, uh, he we were able to do tolerance stacks on our on our uh, components, uh, which is very critical because all of our all of our pieces all go together as one assembly. Um, so so tolerance stacks is basically when you have multiple parts that have to go together and you want them to be able to fit together like you want them to. And there, but there might be some variation on how they fit. So we want our design to be easy to use for the technicians or the engineers at Parker. Therefore, we had to do tolerance stacking calculations to ensure that it fits together the way we wanted it to. And along with that, you know, we, we, cre we created models, 3D models in SolidWorks and uh, 2D drawings like this one here. Um, as deliverables, which Zev is going to kind of describe more of what that is. Okay, thank you, Lane. So um, for Parker, we put together a bill of materials, uh, a standard parts list, which Joseph talked about earlier, and there's and uh, also some comprehensive 2D and 3D drawings of all the custom parts, specifically the electrical connect connector adapter and the top plate, bottom plate, and manifold. So they will be able to recreate those. Uh, we've had a little bit of trouble. They're gonna have to transfer the files over into a different uh, 3D modeling software. But um, that's pretty much it for our presentation. Our whole group wants to thank everyone at Parker and uh, Dr. Monson and Dr. Kim uh, for all their help throughout this entire semester and open it up to any questions. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Kim, uh, back to you.